Okay, hello out there to the AP World History class and my AP World History students. This is it. So this is the last major PowerPoint lecture review that we are doing, and it's for the late modern period. So I hope you are enjoying some time off right now and that you are ready for this last major period that we need to review in order to get ready for the AP test. So once you've got this down, we've got the whole story of world history, the whole 10,000 years that we've been talking about. And hopefully this is going to help you out for the exam. So this particular late modern period is from 1900 to the present. And there is a ton of information that is packed into this period. So let's get rolling on this in order to see all the major events that take place. So you can just have like a general idea about what's going on. So first off, here are the key concepts that they want you guys to remember when it comes to the late modern period. And a lot of words here, a lot of Difficult language to have to get down, and so what I'm going to do for you is summarize each one and paraphrase it and just give you guys a sense about like what should you be knowing over this period, and there are three big things I want you to know. So the first one that we're going to go over at the beginning of the century are the rapid advances that take place in science and technology and how that affects us in a number of ways. It affects us in our understanding of the universe. It affects us in our advances that we've made, things like communication and medicine, transportation, industry, agriculture. But it also affects us in some of the negative things that have happened as well, especially when it comes to the environment. So I want to talk about that as well. The other big key concept for this time period is what happened between peoples and states. Okay, so whenever we say states, I know that gets a little confusing. I'm sure the first place you go to your mind, I know I would if I was 15 or 16 years old, is a state like California where we live or a state like Hawaii where I would love to live. Uh, that's not what we're talking about when we talk about states. What we're talking about states are governments. So how do people and governments around the world, how do they interact? And this key concept is about how peoples and states started challenging the way the world had been ordered. So think about the previous time period that we talked about with European imperialism, American imperialism. So we're starting to see challenges to that and leading into the conflicts that we're seeing today that are very relevant to us today, conflicts like terrorism today. So the last one is the role of the state um, in how it managed things that was going on, especially with the domestic economy. So that's going to be important because it deals with the Great Depression. And that also becomes important for what we've talked about, the dealing with things like the IMF, the World Bank. GATT and how the global economy took off after World War II. Okay, so let's jump into this and we're going to start off with that first key concept that deals with science and progress. And this is so exciting. I mean, to me, when I look at the 20th century and I think about science and progress, this is really what, in my mind, establishes the framework that makes the 20th century so unique and different from other centuries. The previous centuries, we saw a lot of science and progress, but things have kind of all been building up. And at the beginning of the 20th century, we have massive changes that take place. So for example, within the medical field, there was a switch over to something called germ theory. So previously, the theory was fluids theory. There was about four different fluids uh, that people thought you, know, you had to keep in balance. And if you did, that people wouldn't get sick. And if they did get sick, you'd, you'd basically what you'd do is you'd take a knife and cut somebody on their arm to allow some of the fluids out in order to try to balance out the sickness that took place. Actually, believe it or not, there's some truth to this theory. There are some sicknesses where this works. However, in the large scheme of things, number one, it's not accurate. And number two, you end up actually dehydrating the person you do this to. So what happened in the 20th century was using science, people were able to find something called germ theory, where they were able to see that there were good germs and there are bad germs. And using that, they came up with a whole bunch of different solutions to diseases. Probably the most important, of course, is antibiotics. Within the energy field, we see massive changes taking place. Now, this stretches back to the 1700s with the use of things like coal, but we really take off with fossil fuels, especially when it comes to oil, when we get to the late 1800s and early 1900s, and the use of electricity. One of the biggest questions that we have following World War II is the use of nuclear energy, and we're, we're battling over that today. Um, a lot of people fear that if we use nuclear energy, we could cause massive possible problems, especially when it comes uh, to environmental effects. Um, I would make the argument that actually we've made huge advances in nuclear energy and that nuclear energy could be one of the resources we use for the future. In fact, France and Germany have used a lot when it comes to nuclear energy and are very successful in doing that. Uh, another huge advance that takes place that we talked about in class is the Green Revolution and using genetically modified foods. Um, and this, remember that was Norman Borla's idea. If you can inject certain types of genetics into foods like wheat, you can make them much stronger, much sturdier, and then you can use them in order to boost the amount of agriculture you have and feed the world. 
Last up are new technologies that we've seen in transportation and communication, things like the airplane, the radio, the television, and the personal computer. Now, all of this is actually incredibly positive, and we've seen really positive effects that have come out of this. I mean, just take the Green Revolution. The beginning of the century, the belief was we were going to see massive starvation take place. Instead, we've actually seen a growth in the population, right? That sounds pretty good. But there are some major environmental effects that we've seen come out of this. Now, we all know about the overall pollution effects that come, especially when it comes to fossil fuels. But there are other, like, deeper criticisms that have come up that are very important. One comes up from a woman named Rachel Carson, and her argument had to do with something called ecology. So here in California, she went out and she studied eagles, and she found that eaglets, the babies of eagles, were dying, and she was trying to figure out why. And in a lot of cases, they were dying before they could even be hatched out of their eggs. And what she found was that at the time, we were using this thing called DDT, okay, really good example of a fertilizer being used for something like the Green Revolution, that would kill off mosquitoes and that would allow us to grow more crops. What she found, though, was DDT was highly carcinogenic, causes cancer. And that what would happen is that when we use DDT, um, the DDT would work on killing off mosquitoes, but when they kill off mosquitoes, higher level animals like birds would eat the mosquitoes and that cancer causing material would pass on to the eagles. And then that would affect them in their giving birth to eaglets. So why is this important for us? Well, the reason why is that she argued that we are all really connected in nature and that one part of nature, if we end up messing with it, can eventually affect us. The idea being that we aren't outside of nature controlling it, but rather we are within nature and that we are affected by it. So that, of course, brings up the big debate we're having today on climate change and CO2. Uh, the idea being that the more carbon we put out into the atmosphere in order to fuel industrialization, so this goes back to fossil fuels, the more that we are creating sort of this like dome around the world that is trapping heat within the world. Um, I'm not going to get into the debate too much right now just because it would take a long time to get into all the evidence for it, um, but just keep in mind this overall idea that the more we are using these new technologies, the more we are having a negative impact on the overall global atmosphere and global village. So that brings us into world, the, the world wars, and this actually has a huge impact when it comes to technology. So when we entered into World War I, people actually had a very optimistic attitude about technology. But by the end of it, they were really questioning this idea of technology and progress. So why? Well, it was during the world wars in which we saw the use of new technologies like tanks, missiles, and France and Germany started experimenting with chemical weapons. Now, from our mindset today, it's probably like, well, why would you do something like that, right? I mean, this is crazy. But from their mindset, using something like mustard gas at the time seemed to make perfect sense. If we're fighting in a war against an enemy, why don't we use all of the possible resources for us to have? And if I can use science to find something like mustard gas, I should probably use that, right? Well, the end result of all this usage was the death of 10 million people. So by the end of World War I, people were really questioning whether or not technology always led to progress. But then we get to World War II, and now there are even deeper questions of technology, because now we have airplanes that can do something called carpet bombing, where they would just drop tons of bombs onto industrial centers. And that basically cut the line between military and civilians. Now, all of a sudden, you could drop all these bombs in industrial centers and justify it saying, you know, people go into factories, they make bombs for the war. We're just bombing factories, right? But you're not really. You end up bombing areas where civilians are. And of course, the war has ended with the use of the atomic bombs in both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, raising fears of a possible arms race in the future. The end result of World War II was the death of 30 million people. So now there's a real questioning of technology and progress. Now, when all this is done, a new issue comes up, and this gets into that second key concept that's really important. So not only is there a questioning of technology, at the end of World War II, there's now a questioning of the previous belief systems from European imperialism, belief systems like social Darwinism and scientific racism. Countries in what today we call the developing world broke away from Europeans and started saying, you know something, we have a right to have our own independence or what they call sovereignty. So some examples of that you should remember. In India, there was Gandhi's Sutigraha movement which was basically a movement, it was a spiritual Hindu movement that basically called for a middle ground between British imperialism and India being isolated from the world. And Gandhi basically said we should use nonviolence in order to enter into the world, but as, as a way that India was unique. And so Gandhi really wanted to have India be an agricultural country that eventually became an industrialized country. In Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh attempted to gain Vietnamese independence, first from the French, then from the Americans. And he adopted communism in order to do that. In Africa, Jomo Kenyatta established independence for Kenya and started calling for this idea of pan-Africanism, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But pan-Africanism, just to give you an idea, connecting all Africans together to gain independence. 
So what were these independence movements all based on? Well, one of the big ones that we talked about this year was in communism. There were movements in Russia, China, Vietnam, and Cuba, and all of them used communism really to question European and American imperialism. So like Russia and China, when we look at it, you know, a lot of people think communism is about taking over the world. And when you go back to original Marxism, Marxism did talk about the need for reforms around the European world and eventually going out to the whole world. But the places where communism was used, it was really about trying to gain independence, especially uh, from places like Europe and America. In Africa, there was what was called the Pan-African Movement, which tried to unite African countries against European imperialists. In the Middle East, uh, eventually after the 1950s, there were Islamic religious movements that tried to reestablish an Islamic caliphate. So the two big ones that we've heard a lot about in the news, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. So remember, uh, when this, when 9/11 happened, President Bush at the time said, "You know, Al Qaeda is coming after us because they want to take away our freedom. Um, they don't like that." Well, Osama bin Laden. I'm not trying to justify him in any way here. Uh, Osama bin Laden came out and basically said, "I laugh at that because honestly, if we were out to take away your freedom, we would have gone after the Netherlands. They're a lot more free than you are in the United States." What Al Qaeda and ISIS wanted to do was to create a new caliphate, going back to the time period of the Umayyads and the Abbasids. They wanted to create a caliphate that would stretch from North Africa all the way up to South, Southeast Asia. Now, of course, they did not succeed, and thank God that's the case. Um, but the, the Islamic religious movements really have been about reestablishing sort of like an Islamic nationalism and Islamic identity. So um, one of the case studies to kind of understand like where these conflicts come from, that I think is so important in the 20th century because it gets into the ideas of social Darwinism, imperialism, and what Europe did and what America did at this time period is the case study of Israel and Palestine and what their conflict's about. So at the end of World War I, the Ottoman Empire finally collapsed. And when it did, Britain and France came in and they wanted to take control. Why? I think it's kind of obvious from that time period, they wanted control over the oil markets there. Fossil fuels had become more and more important and now with cars and um, planes and so forth, they now had a chance to fuel all this if they could get a hold of the oil. So what Britain and France did was they created what's called mandates where they redrew boundaries in the Middle East and created what we're seeing today of the modern countries within the Middle East. Now, one of the things they did there, and there's a famous story about it, was they were not sensitive to the Sunni-Shiite split that was within the Arab world that goes back for centuries. And a good example of that is Winston Churchill. Churchill, we all know, was the leader of Britain during World War II, was kind of like moving his way up in the British government right after World War I. And he was sent out there, and there's a story that one morning he woke up, and as he was eating his breakfast, he loved to eat big breakfast, he belched. And as he did so, he accidentally drew in a boundary into one of the countries. And he looked at it, and he said, yeah, you know something? That actually looks really good. I think I'm going to keep that. Whether or not that story is true and accurate, it demonstrates the insensitivity of what the Europeans did at the time. So at the time, Jewish people were starting to move into the area doing, due to their Zionist movement. The Zionist movement was an attempt to gain a homeland for the Jewish people because of all the problems they were facing in Europe uh, with anti-Semitism. And then, of course, after World War II with the Holocaust, Jewish people really wanted a place to call their own and to create a state that would protect them around the world. So the English promised the Jewish people a nation. They said, no problem. We'll take care of you. We're going to promise a nation. Then they went to the Arabs and said, yeah, we're going to promise you a nation, too. And this is very famous in the Balfour Declaration, where the English promised the Jews a nation, but then kind of promised the Arabs the same thing and played them off of each other. Eventually, the English leave this area, and they leave that fight to the Arabs and to the Jewish people. And in 1948, the Jewish people finally said, enough is enough. We are going to declare a certain amount of land for our nation. And they did so in what today we see as Israel, but they actually did so only on uh, the most western side. And so just to give you an idea about how big that is, uh, it's the size of New Jersey cut in half. That's how big the Israelis called for for their nation. At the same time, just keep in mind that there were Arab families who had been living in the Ottoman Empire on that land for centuries, and this was their family's land. And so in 1948, when the Israelis made this declaration, five Arab countries went to war against Israel. In the end, Israel won that war and doubled the size of their land. And when I say doubled, that means that it's the size of almost what we see today of Israel. There are a few other areas that got added on later, but it's basically the size of New Jersey. And from there on out, we've seen this fight uh, between the Arab countries and between the Israeli nation. Notice, though, the context. The context here is, is, is European imperialism, the desire for oil, and really the insensitivity, the drawing of boundaries without really thinking about what the long-term effects would be. The other big issue that comes up culturally and ideologically for this time period is the issue of genocide. So in the 20th century, you know, uh, there is this attack 
on scientific racism and social Darwinism, but that comes a little bit later. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was an acceptance of those belief systems. And so there were a number of genocidal attacks on people. For example, the first one is in, uh, is in Turkey. So right before the Ottoman Empire falls, a group of, of people ran the Ottoman Empire called the Young Turks, and they attacked the Armenians in World War I. Now why? Well, the Armenians were Christian, generally speaking, and the Armenians had some background in connection with Russia in the sense that being Christian, the Russians are Eastern Orthodox. And so the young, the young Turks believed that the Armenians might ally with the Russians during World War I against the Young Turks. There were some Armenians who did, but the vast majority did not. Uh, most of the Armenians saw themselves as Turkish. They saw themselves as a part of the Turkish country, um, and, and they wanted to remain in connection uh, with that country. They were very nationalist. But the Young Turks ended up attacking them and massacred them, killed them. Basically, two million Armenians uh, lost their lives or were exiled out of the country. Adolf Hitler, actually, we have uh, documents in which he talked about what happened to the Armenians and said that was his model and what he did. Of course, for Hitler, is much more expansive than that. There were a number of reasons why he did what he did, but he ended up attacking the Jewish people during World War II and called them this internal infestation against Germany's Aryans. And then near the end of the century, in the 1990s, we see uh, genocides that take place within the developing world. So, for example, uh, it took place with the Rwandan Hutus, who attacked the Tutsis in the 1990s, claiming that the Tutsis were collaborators with the Belgians back in the 1950s, 1960s. So how do we put this all together? Like, what should we think about when it comes to genocide? I would suggest three main points just to think about. Typically, a genocide takes place, and it's taken place in the 20th century, based upon, number one, there has to be an external threat. So like, for example, a world war or an environmental crisis. So in the case of like World War I, World War II, there were economic crises, there, were, there was something going on outside. In the case recently that we've seen in places like Rwanda, or for example in the Sudan, there was another recent example of that, there's usually an environmental crisis, like a lack of water. Then what happens is the group that's in power will define an internal group, some minority, as being like a disease, an insect, or a cancer. And that's really important because it's a way to basically otherize or say that that group is somehow not really human. And that's the third major thing that happens. The powerful group defines the minority as this internal threat, and they are an other. So now let's move into the economic aspects. So it's that, like that last key concept that's really important, and that is the key concept of globalization. So these are parallel tracks that we're seeing between science and technology, what happens in culture um, as far as racism and the desire to break away and form your own countries. But there's a third one that overlaps with a lot of this, and that is the process of globalization. So back in the 1930s, the Great Depression hit, and when it did, there was a real questioning of whether or not capitalism is really the way to go economically. And so we had two responses, fascism and communism. Fascism is the belief that the government creates massive investments for the military. Uh, they work with businesses to do this. And so it's known as corporatism. And the reason why is that the government is making a partnership with corporations, in this particular case, to create a stronger military. And by doing that, people have to, you know, how do you get bombs and tanks and planes? Well, you have to have people to make them, right? So you can provide jobs for people. So like, for example, what we oftentimes forget, and, and don't get me wrong when I say this, and by no means am I justifying Adolf Hitler, by no means. But the question that comes up is like, why was he successful for a while? Well, a big part of the reason why is because he did what, at the time, America was not doing. So America had a 25% unemployment rate. Germany had less than a 2% unemployment rate. Why? Because they hired a ton of people to make bombs and weapons. Of course, the problem is, once you've done that, what are you going to do with all these things? Well, you go out and conquer. And that led into Hitler expanding and then over-expanding into Russia and eventually his demise. Second big option was communism. And in communism, the idea was to create five-year plans in which you would move farmers into urban centers through a process of collectivization. Remember, we talked about this in class. You tax farmers, you then take that tax money, and you create industries, and then you try to get people to move into the cities. Uh, it sounds like a pretty good process, but, in, but if we take a look at Russia and China, what ended up happening was they demoralized their population uh, by taking away so much land from farmers and they really misallocated their resources. They tried to have the government basically plan everything, and typically it doesn't work very well. So what's the opposite response that happens after World War II? It's the Western response, and that is done by the U.S. and Northern Europe. Uh, they did this through three big organizations, the IMF, the World Bank, and really a treaty called GATT. The IMF established rules for development. The World Bank then provides loans for developing countries to industrialize. And then the GATT, which is the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, lowered tariffs to increase international trade, try to bring countries together in order to develop themselves industrially. So in order to, to create that international marketplace, 
uh, countries began creating a new global order. Now, be careful. When I say a new global order, I'm not talking about a conspiracy here. I'm talking about a need to create institutions that allow countries to work together to create a global marketplace. Um, so, for example, the United Nations was created after World War II to be a place of international diplomacy. The International Criminal Court was established to try to deal with problems of genocide. And then the big economic institutions were created. The WTO. Now, be careful. This is not GATT. WTO was created in the 1990s, and it was done in order to allow countries to sue one another if they did not lower tariffs. The EU was created in about, really, 1970s, and then it, it gradually morphed into the EU today, the European Union, which is a common market in which they lowered tariffs in Europe to create more trade. Then America, Mexico, and Canada created their own, something called NAFTA, which is a free trade agreement to lower tariffs between the US, Mexico, and Canada to compete with the EU. So what are our big takeaways to finish this off? A lot of stuff going on in the 20th century, but I was just three big things that you want to remember. Number one, the 20th century starts with a sense of incredible optimism and progress based upon science and technology. And of course, there's questioning that now based upon the environmental effects. Two, the 20th century included decolonization independence due to imperialism. And that leads into fights within the developing world between different ethnic groups uh, that has led in some cases to genocides. Keep in mind the bigger context of how European imperialists and American imperialists really were not sensitive to these problems and kind of created the conditions for them. And number three, that the globe has been separated into two basically northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, what we call developing versus developed worlds, in which today what they're trying to do is increase international trade by lowering tariffs in order to increase industrial development. That is its own positive and negative impacts that we talked about in class. But I want you to remember that as being the big economic change. So I will see you guys back at school and in class. Hopefully this was helpful. And this is it. This is the last major uh, review for you guys leading into the AP exam. See you soon. Bye.